Hey guys, it is Sob Talk Live. So glad you joined us. I'm Lee Kelso, one of the couple of guys who is here with you every Thursday at eight o'clock. Talk about Sobs and uh, just how much we love these crazy cars. Tonight, we're focusing on classic car insurance. And it's something that uh, I learned about the hard way. Some of you guys probably saw a, a post that I made earlier today about well, something that happened to me. So let me share that with you as well. So I had done uh, quite a bit of work on my um, 1989 Saab 900, converting it from a um, automatic into a five-speed. And uh, some old lady came across the, the highway at us and darn near hit us head on, but I put it off into a ditch. And uh, after all the work that I had done on that car, man, that was a real heartbreaker, I'll tell you. Uh, but the one thing I did well, um, was plan ahead and I had classic car insurance. So when I suffered that total loss of that car, I wasn't out completely all the cash that I put into it because I had something called agreed value insurance. And that's something we're going to talk about tonight. So let me bring our subject matter expert to the show. This is Jim Cruzy. Jim is a longtime car guy and proprietor of Car Connection Advisors. Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks, Lee. Glad to be here. I'm sorry to see those pictures, by the way. That's the first time I saw those. So Yeah, that was, a, that was sad, but you know what? Taught me an important lesson. Before we get to that, uh, let's talk about what you do and uh, your role here at Car Connection Advisors. Tell yeah, me about sure. that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a 30-plus uh, year um, collector car insurance industry guy, um, uh, second-generation car collector as well. And uh, uh, in a kind of a second part of my career here, kind of getting out of insurance here a little bit, actually helping people navigate um, the disillusion, the, the, the selling of their collections, um, kind of planning out a roadmap of what happens next. Uh, as we all know, we're all just caretakers of cars. We don't actually own them. Someday someone that's else right. will. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, and so that's what I do now. So it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing time for, you know, collectors all around the world. I mean, this is an international business. I mean, you're in the Swedish side with your sobs, certainly. Uh, so you're aware of that. So that's what I do now. I really kind of help people just kind of navigate through all the issues. And there are a lot of issues. And oh. obviously you deal, just looking at the inventory and what I saw on your website, you deal with a lot higher value cars than, than some of our sobs possibly, right? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, yes and no. I mean, it's uh, um, when you look at car values and who owns them, uh, a million dollar car to a guy that's worth a hundred million dollars isn't that big a deal. A fifteen thousand dollar car to a guy that's worth a hundred thousand dollars is a huge deal. Yeah. So, in fact, there's I think almost a greater necessity for people with I don't want to say entry level, but kind of entry level or mid level collector cars or future mm -hmm. classics is another term that we like to use. I think there's a, a real need for people in that category, um, sincerely. So classic car insurance is, I think, a tremendous value. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had that car insured for, it wasn't a lot, I think 6,500 bucks or something. Cost me $100 a year, $200 yeah. a year. And I was so darn happy after that accident, a brief investigation, and then I didn't have to haggle. There wasn't right. negotiation. Uh, they just said, okay, here's what we owe you. It, yep. was, it was the way to go. So uh, what do I need to know about classic car insurance? Well, uh, uh, first, um, it's available in all 50 states. So I know you've got uh, listeners all over the country. And if you have international listeners, there's programs in Canada and Mexico. It's, it's worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, it's very simple to, to get. Because um, generally, I mean, let's face it, the accident you you had is a rare one. Consequently, that's why your premiums are so low. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a very simple process, much easier than uh, uh, getting standard insurance typically. Um, mm -hmm. So, and as long as the cars are collectible, typically, and not a daily driver, that's one of the main things. I mean, it can't be a car you drive every day. Uh, you're that's the, the the first couple of things that that needs to happen to. It's a gateway into a collector card insurance type program. So I went out and did a little looking around online, and here's what I found that typically, and I know this isn't for every insurance carrier, but they have to be 
over 25 years old and appreciating in value, or if they're under 25 years old, they have to be appreciating or kind of be rare in some way. And then you can see the other factors that go into play there. Does that square up with what you were when you were in this industry? Yeah, it, it does. And But one, but one thing to, uh, to remember, um, even cars that, that you would think wouldn't be of uh, appreciating or rare, unique values, things like limited miles. You can have fairly common cars that have very low miles that all of a sudden make them a collectible. Mm -hmm. So my, my advice to everybody when it comes to this is don't assume anything. If you've got a car that, that you take care of and it's, it's a, an appreciating asset to you, pick up the phone and call a company and explain your situation. And like you said, there's multiple companies that do this. So if one mm -hmm. person says no, call somebody else. How do I document what my car is worth? I went back through and kind of took a look at what I was seeing out on bring a trailer for a car yep. that was sort of my age, my connection, my condition, and came yep. up with that $6,500 number. Um, is that the right way to go? Uh, it, it can be. I mean, on, on newer cars like that, you absolutely can find updated and recent sales. I mean, a lot of people want to lean towards, you know, value price guides and things like that. There's, in my mind, there's really no need for those anymore. Um, pretty much any car that's that that, that you want, um, you can find one like it that's been sold somewhere fairly recently, thanks to the the inter internet's there out there for you. Uh, makes everybody a genius. So what you did was exactly right. You find a similar car, and and price it that way. Good way to do it. And you know the the great the great thing about uh, the Saab world is we're seeing prices climbing. Uh, yeah. for a lot of these cars. So as I think they are for all cars right now, the car market generally is kind of on fire right now, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and what you're going to find, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Sonnet fan myself. I'd love to have mm -hmm. a Sonnet too at some point. I mean, I think they're one of the most undervalued collectors out there. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. cool. They are. And, and so as you see other 1960s two door sport cars go up, people will find cars like that and values will increase. And that carries all the way through. I mean, Saab, they don't make them. I mean, they stopped production a while ago and it's a, an old brand. It's great. So one of the concepts that we need to get a, uh, our arms around here is some of the lingo that they right. use in this industry. And um, so I came across this describing actual cash value versus agreed value. Those are important to understand. Can you tell me the difference? Absolutely. So actual cash value, is basically, in the simplest terms, it's a depreciating value from the point of when the car was purchased. So let's say you go out and buy, you know, a, a new minivan today, let's say, or a new Volvo. Let's say you buy a new Volvo. As soon as you drive that car off the lot, it's worth 20% more than when you purchased it. Um, it also means when, at the time of loss, the insurer is that at that point going to decide what it's worth as opposed to an agreed value policy, which you decide that up front. So there's no question if at the time at the time of loss what you're going to get paid. So it's really peace of mind insurance is what it is. Um, you, you know, a lot of people have been involved in accidents with daily drivers, and that's always an issue when it comes time for the payout. What am I going to get? And right. it's never enough. It, yeah. it just it just isn't. Yeah. Whereas again, agreed value. I mean, you might look back on your convertible now with little different eyes and think may have done better than 6,500. I mean, that might've been 8,500 or 10 grand, yeah. um, you know, just the way it goes, but that's, I get it. Um, I was just trying to be fair. You know, the other, yeah. the, the, the kick about this, what I thought was kind of funny was I wanted to buy the wreck. And, uh, so of course there, uh, I, I, I offered him some, some cash. I offered him 500 bucks. Yeah. And, uh, they said, no, we have to go through an evaluation period. So yeah. Okay, fine. A couple of days later, I get a call and they say, hey, your car is worth $25.99. And I'm thinking, what? $2,600 wow. for that? You're, you're, you're crazy. And they said, no, no, $25.99. There you go. <laughs> so, so I'm glad I didn't pay them the 500 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's typically how it works. I mean, there's the, the largest company out there for um, wrecked and damaged vehicles is called Copart. Yeah, sure. And um, again, a lot of club guys already know this, but um, if you do lose your car to the insurer, that's typically where it's going to go. And you can buy it then off online. Very simple process. But uh, yeah, a lot of people want to retain the salvage. I get it. 
So there is some uh, uh, another important consideration here, and that is there are specific limitations associated mm -hmm. with this. And um, let's talk through those a little bit and help everybody understand what that's about. Yeah. So generally, a car that's collectible, it means more than just utilitarian usage for you. Uh, it means you're only going to use it for pleasure use. In other words, weekends, car shows, and things like that. That being said, more and more companies are coming up with programs where you can, you do have the ability to drive it occasionally to work, let's say. Um, well, I should say when we all used to go to the office, you know, mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, when, you, when people were going to work, you, I mean, today you're just driving it to your own garage because that's where most people are working from. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, so pleasure use only isn't necessarily uh, 100% now, which is good for people, with, good. especially with newer cars like a lot of your sob club members have. Um, they want to use them a little bit more because you can. Um, my background is actually in turn of the century, pre-1915 cars. That's, those are definitely not cars that you're going to be driving to work, right? <laughs> but your 90 Saab convertible, absolutely, potentially, you might want to do it that one Friday of the month where there's a car show down the street, blah, blah, blah. So, again, ask your in insurance agency on that. Mileage restrictions, um, they vary um, if you're somebody that doesn't drive the car very much, sure, you can get a very limited mileage policy. Um, I will tell you, though, more and more companies are going with unlimited mileage because, let's face it, a lot of cars don't even have odometers. I mean, you get back in the 1940s and 50s and 30s, they didn't have them. Yeah. So how do you check mileage if there's no odometer? So they've yeah. kind of thrown that out the window. Good point. So something else to think about. And then as far as repair and coverage limits, I mean, one thing that I would stress for everybody, it go with a company that allows you to take your car to the shop of your choice. And the reason why that's super important is that a lot of people, um, uh, they, they've, they've taken to the same mechanic for years. They understand the car. They don't have to relearn it. I mean, mm -hmm. even cars that came off the production lines, you know, three VIN, VIN numbers apart, there's differences between those. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a guy that knows your car up front, everybody's going to be happier, including the insurance company, by the way. I mean, they don't want anybody mm -hmm. learning um, the first time on it, they'd rather have somebody there that, that knows your car. So, so let um, me ask this, if I have a policy, uh, that is pleasure use only. Mm -hmm. So let's say that, um, I then insure the car with another company that is traditional insurance. So if I have a loss, uh -huh. I know you can't claim it twice, yep. but, but could I choose, okay, it fit this category. So I'm going to make the claim with that company or it fit this category. So I'm going to make the claim over here. Does that work? Yeah, no, not really. I mean, there's, um, you can't double insure something. I know you're saying that you, you would just pick which company to go with, right. but um, one of the questions on most applications is who is the car insured previously. There's disclosure processes there to figure that out. And uh, if, if, if you do think that you, you've got a car that, uh, that in your mind it's a collector, but you want to drive it every day. And again, modern cars that's absolutely a possibility. Sure. You're, you're better off just going with a standard auto insurer at that point where there is no gray area. Um, that's what everybody tries to avoid. Uh, and it's best to do that up front as opposed to after a loss. So um, what is stated value insurance? Is that the same as agreed or is it different? No, no stated value is the stated value on the policy or actual cash value, whichever is least, whichever is least. So what, where that is really used, that's almost, it's, it's a commercial form of evaluation and really it's used for like trucking companies with big power units where they don't, they, they want to know that, um, you know, the, the maximum amount each power unit is, is used or it's going to be insured for that way they can, it's a, it's a budgeting process more than anything else. Now stated value is, uh, is not what you want. And I honestly don't know of any mainstream collector car company now that offers that it's either it's, it's agreed value is is pretty much the norm at this point. Okay, so then uh, so then we move into uh, coverage options, and I understand mm -hmm. there are several. I found, for example, uh, some offer various level of roadside yep. assistance, uh, and some of them have towing distance variations. Some will yep. take you hundred miles, some ten miles. You know, so you need to shop around for that. Um, when it comes to spare parts, uh, what is an uh, indication of a spare part coverage? So again, that's going to vary by company, but in general, there are uh, additional parts for the vehicle that you're insuring. So if you've got a, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to think and, and keep this relationship to your Saab folks. If you've got a, 
uh, if you're trying to insure a Saab and you've got a, a Mustang 302 engine in your garage, that that's not going to work. But if you've got a Saab 96 three cylinder motor in the, in the garage and you've got a Saab 96, that's spare parts for that car. Absolutely. That's insurable at that point as spare oh. parts for the car. So and, that's insurable in case of like a, a casual, a property loss, a fire yeah. or something like that, flood, something like that? Theft, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt okay. about it. Somebody breaks in your garage and, and had the heart set on that three-cylinder, two-cycle motor. Yes, you could actually turn that claim in at that point. So, And then yeah. uh, one of the companies listed repair parts coverage. So is that to say uh, I get to use OEM parts even if cheaper alternatives are available? So... Um, the hard part about that is even if a lot of times OEM is not available. So your cars, absolutely, you can get them for some models. I mean, not mm -hmm. all of them. At some point, sure. you're, you're back to looking at swap meets and things like that. So <laughs> yeah. um, in, in most cases, uh, the, the limiting factor is how much you have the car insured for. So like your Saab, you had it insured for $6,500. You know, you find OEM doors, fenders, all that. You're you're way beyond sixty five hundred dollars at that point. Mm -hmm. So, as far as parts replacement goes, typically it has more to do with what you insured the car for, as opposed to um, what they're going to repair it with. Um, and again, let's face it: in a lot of cases, all you have is reproduction parts. I mean, yeah. you look at uh, the you know the, the dots and two forty Zs and things like that that they're starting mm -hmm. to bring back to us. Um, there's a ton of aftermarket stuff out there for those things. Dotson wasn't making them until recently, and now they are. It's just a matter of demand. So there's a lot of sobs still on the road. So potentially for some models, they might the factory might start reproducing those again. And maybe they are. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not a sob expert. Well, if, the factory doesn't exist anymore. There's nobody. But Oreo is a company that I think we're going to be we're working to get them represented here in the future that has access to lots of parts. And um, yeah. yeah, so there is some stuff. But well, yeah, there are some very, some very severe shortages. And there are some things that are just unobtainium, yeah. as we say. Yeah. Well, educate me a little bit. So when the factory closed, what happened to all the dyes and all that stuff? You know, I don't know. Uh, okay. I don't know what happened with all of that. I know there was a, a follow on company and somebody out there who knows the answer, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll, we'll share it with everybody. Um, uh, but a, a different company bought them. And then I think a lot of it went to China where they were now, I think manufacturing them as electric cars. Um, I'm, I'm okay. a little thin on that. Don't know. Well, um, I mean, that's a future show for you because exactly when, when factories close, they typically just don't throw those things away. And uh, you know, somebody smarter than me, bought all that stuff for pennies on the dollar, especially when you've got potential cars out there that, I mean, they made them for a lot of years and they were very similar. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So here's a question. I think you can probably see that Jim, uh, yeah. Michael Gunn asking, oh. uh, what, what can he do about his base 94, 900? So that's a car that, I mean, not to insult you, Michael, but it's not going to have tremendous value. Will, will insurers care about something like that? So one, one of the, um, inside baseball hints I can give you it's as much about the person that has the car as the car itself and you can have two identical cars one is not insurable and one is really based on the applicant the applicant being um, a member of the Saab club um, you know it, 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 others other Saabs potentially um, for, for cars that are borderline collectible companies a lot of times will, will make the decision that yeah, he's going to keep it as a collector. He's a collector, as opposed to the guy who's just looking for a winner beater car in Montana, um, which is a completely different situation, and, and that's mm -hmm. not anything to insure. So, yeah, absolutely, um, that, that's that that potentially could be a, a collector car for a company. So, and I want to wrap up this optional coverage just because I thought it was interesting, um, event specific. So, even if if your car is at the event but you're not there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the car is insured. And then also if you are injured or if someone is injured involving your car at that event, it involves some level of coverage there. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. It's a, um, uh, for the injury, that's just medical payments. Mm -hmm. And the best way to describe that medical payments is uh, no fault coverage that if you slam, if somebody slams their finger in your, in your car door, mm -hmm. automatically, the typically it starts at a thousand dollars. It just gets paid. Um, some companies are ex extending that to higher limits. Um, it's, it's, 
it's a bit of a throw in coverage because most events that you go to, if you get injured while you're there, there's coverage for the event itself. Um, over and above actually before the auto insurance at that point. So it's just something there An event specific coverage. I'm not quite sure what that's referring to there. So okay. um, I can't speak to that. And, uh, you know, as I knew somebody would, a uh, friend of the program, Kelly, uh, Oh. Let's us know that a Rio bought all the dyes and all that stuff. So yeah, okay. I was just just uh, talking with somebody from a Rio about being on the show in the future, and uh, so hopefully we'll get that worked out. So that's great. Uh, here's another question: Have a ninety ninety SPG. It's my driver. Also have a parts car. Does the eighty eight count toward parts spare parts? And how do I insure it? That's a great question. Yeah, um, it would if that if that is your. I mean, a lot of times, let's face it. When you're restoring a car, you got two to make one. And so mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest thing is, um, again, from the insurance company standpoint, they're getting a premium for that. It's not much. And as long as it makes sense and you can say, you can kind of give them an itemized list. I'm using the doors. I got the dash, whatever. Um, absolutely. You could do that. Um, you also might want to consider, even though you may not put it on the road, just insure it as the second, as a second car, as opposed to just parts. Um, it doesn't have to be licensed for the road to get liability insurance for it. Oh, Stranger okay. things have happened. You're, uh -huh. you're pushing a car around the shop and the neighbor's three-year-old comes in and he gets his foot run over. Well, that's a liability claim, right? Even right. if that car is a parts car, it's still an auto. It's not going to be covered on your homeowner's insurance. Put that on your, put that on your policy as a second car. You realize you know how inexpensive it is. It's it's minimal dollars, and so mm -hmm. you're covered both ways, both for liability and then also for the spare parts coverage at the same time. What about uh, comprehensive claims? So mm -hmm. my car is scratched, damaged, bump, whatever, at an event or just out on the road. Yeah. Um, how does the agreed value nature of that work, or is that agreed value only for a total loss? Nope. Uh, agreed. That, again, that that's actually a, a well worded question there. Um, your agreed value is what they're going to pay you right up into that. Take your car, for example, $6,500. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you're convertible, you're at a show and somebody scratched the door, uh, they will pay, they will repair that car um, basically for what it costs. Right. Um, I'm not going to say a door scratch could cost up to $6,500, but if it does, potentially your car could be totaled because that's yeah. all, that's all it's insured for. And uh, where that really comes in, it becomes a problem is when you get very, very expensive cars mm -hmm. where people are not willing to insure them to value. And all at once you get a smash fender on a $30,000 car and the person only insured it for 10, you could potentially total a car for just a smashed fender because they didn't insure it for the right amount. So you, the insuring to value is critically important no matter what the value of the car is just to make sure you're not going to lose out in the event of, uh, of a partial loss. And that's what you call that when it's just minor damage. So, so I'm just kind of curious, you, you deal in a pretty rarefied atmosphere of cars, mm -hmm. um, pre 1915. A lot of those I'm sure are quite rare and quite valuable. Give me an idea of what's the big number car that, that, that you've seen and have suffered a loss and, and what have they gone through? So, the, Believe it or not, and I'm going to throw another kind of term in here. Um, the biggest loss that I was ever involved in was a multi-million dollar Ferrari where the motor was stolen. And as you know, matching numbers for cars. Yeah, it's critical. Significant. Yeah. And the car sitting there in the garage, it looks terrific, except the motor's gone. So now all of a sudden, it, it, at that point, it almost goes to court. What's, what's the value of the car worth at that point if a significant piece is missing? Again, it's a very rare circumstance. Um, the cars, even the cars that I own, would never suffer that type of a fate. But uh, there's big issues out there on big dollar cars. And, um, you know, sometimes people with very expensive cars can't afford to have them. And sometimes collector car insurance is an easy way to clear up debts, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Uh, and things like that happen. So it just does. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think I shared, I, I paid, I, I seemed like it was a couple hundred dollars a year, practically nothing for yeah. that classic car insurance. Um, 
Is that about the right price? What should I expect to pay for a, let's say I've got a sob I'm gonna value at $25,000. Any sense for what that's gonna be? Yeah, I mean, a rule of thumb is 60 to 70 cents um, per every $100 of value. So if you're a, a $20,000 car, uh, should cost you 120 mm -hmm. to $150 a year. Yeah. Um, and the physical damage is the most important part. And one thing I want to point out here, something that that everybody always overlooks is the third party liability. You t let's take your accident, for example. The yes. other person was at fault. Just as easily, you might have been at fault. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you've got a totaled car plus other people's injuries. And that's something that a lot of people forget about. You, as easy as your car being damaged, you could hurt someone else. And so you want to make sure that you've got adequate third-party liability to uh, pay for property damage of someone else, their car, their property, bodily injury. And typically what an insurance company does there, they basically ask you, what are you carrying right now on your standard auto? Most people carry like 100,000 per accident, 300,000 um, 100, per person, 300,000 per accident, and they'll match it. That's what they'll mm -hmm. do. Uh, but don't shortchange the liability side um, on vehicles because if you didn't insure your $6,500 SOB, the most you're going to be out $6,500. If you don't take care of the liability, it's un it's unknown. It yeah. could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Absolutely. I am a huge advocate for personal liability policies. So I have a couple million dollar umbrella policy that uh, just, uh, why wouldn't you do that? It's inexpensive coverage, That's right. right? Yeah, I think so. Um, what about uh, the situation in which uh, I'm at fault mm -hmm. and there is loss of the vehicle? Does that matter? No. Uh, agreed value is agreed value. So you're at fault. Again, let's, let's turn your accident around, your personal accident. You're at fault now. You totaled your car. The insurance company is going to cut you a check for $6,500. Uh, so that doesn't make any difference. The only other step then is taking care of the other party that was injured. Um, and that's where it can kind of get ugly sometimes. If anybody, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of the people watching today have been involved in an accident, it's cars, it happens. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that gets a little dirtier when there's people hurt. I'm, I hope no one was hurt in your accident. Was everybody okay in yours? Uh, wife and I were fine. Uh, wow. that Steve sob, Klein. you know, they're yep. built, the guy dragging it out of the, out of the, uh, out of the ditch. Uh, the, the tow truck driver said, pretty lucky you're in this car. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, it's true. they're built like tanks. Uh, okay, so um, let's just uh, shift gears just a second here as we wrap things up. We'd like to keep these to about 30 minutes, so we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, what is a collector car out there that you think is one that could be snagged and have some increase in value? Uh, you just mentioned the 240Zs. Those things are almost too expensive these days for a lot of guys yeah. to get into. What's next? Now, one thing I would tell you, though, on cars like that, it's still a bit of an insider's game. You can still find those cars, um, the Craigslist of the world. You just have to look for them. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Indiana, we called ourselves the knot hole gang. And the knot hole gang were people that went around and looking barn sightings, look looking through holes, the knot yeah. holes, to oh, see that's what's cool. in there. Yeah, that's neat. And, and uh, I started out with vintage bicycles and motorcycles, and that's where I found them all. You can do the very same thing today on things like Craigslist. and. Yep. I know there's there's spiders that people search the whole country and things like that, but you just gotta be diligent about it. So, you know, other cars that uh, that were that I think that you know going forward you're gonna see, you know, big big value increases. We're seeing them now. Um, late '80s Olds Cutlasses. Uh, what? Wait, wait, back up a second. What? Yeah, it's like so an exciting about that. Two doors. Land just a car. memory car. It's what yeah. I remember. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta you gotta think about what most people but pulls them to a, an era. Um, you know, I graduated from high school in 1987. Um, my, my first car was a, a, a 74 Plymouth Fury. Second car was 69 Camaro. Uh, mm -hmm. My third car was an 86 Oldsmobile um, maroon two-door Landau top. Radio didn't work, but it was cool because it was a two-door. Velour yeah. interior, those cars are coming around. So you really got to kind of look at human nature as much as anything to determine that stuff. Um, and then you're talking part of the country. If you're in Southern states, man, look, keep looking for Volkswagens, convertibles, nice 
going back to your sobs, I'm sorry. I still think the Sonnet 2 and 3s are incredibly undervalued. Um, they're super cool. If it said Alpha on it, they'd be $100,000 mm -hmm. cars. Wow. I, I just, why nobody's caught on, I don't know, but there's an opportunity there. Wow. Yeah. How about that? That's great. Hey, buddy, I appreciate your time. Thank you yeah. very much. Great to uh, great to connect with you and share all this tremendous information. I think we've uh, given everybody, I hope, a good understanding of classic car insurance and why it's a great value. It treats your car as an asset, that's right? an appreciating asset instead of a, a depreciating asset. So I think that's a key thing to keep in mind. That's right. I uh, uh, hope everybody will drop by and visit uh, Jim's website. It is uh, let me just put it right back up here again because everybody's not going to remember. There it is, carnectionadvisors.com. You can poke around there and see some of the kind of the cool stuff that he deals with. And of course, I'll have a link to that and uh, in the post that follows up here. Yeah, Buddy, I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, one more thing. Feel free to reach out. I mean, just car questions. I'm, I'm a car guy, right? And so um, I learn as much from people I talk to every day as what I've learned over the last 30 years. So send me a note. Love to hear from you. Hey, thanks so much, Jim. Thanks, appreciate Lee. it. See you later. Take care. Yep. Yeah. What a nice guy. And uh, gosh, so much information there. I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, we'll be back again next Thursday evening at eight o'clock. Hopefully Mark will join me then. And we will see you right here on Sob Talk Live. Take care, everybody.